All right. Well, good morning, everyone. I hope everyone had a a good morning, having a good morning. Better than me. <laughs> I jacked my knee up again, but that's okay. Um, anyway, well, it's good to be here. Welcome everybody to Truth Baptist Church here at Sunday School Hour. And um, Anthony, it's good to see you, man. Thank you. It's good to see you. Good to see you, buddy. Good to see you. Good to see you. It's good to see everybody here in our fresh, smiling, refreshed faces. And all right. So anyway. What we're going to do is we're going to continue our, our study on our quote-unquote building on doctrine slash, uh, you know, uh, dispensational right to bound the truth type of situation. And we're going to look at, you know, the continuing one of these transitional books. Um, on Thursday, if you were with us on Thursday, um, if not, uh, what we did on Thursday is we did the transitional book of Matthew. We looked at the book of Matthew. We looked at how certain things in, in Matthew are very much different than what they are here in, in the Pauline epistles, what we are for the church age. And we noticed that the book of Matthew has a what type of flavor to it? A Jewish flavor to it. It's primarily Jewish. Uh, we saw through there all the way from Matthew about 1 all the way to about maybe about about 12, where it was all Jew, 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 and the physical kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of heaven, and then the Jews completely rejected Jesus Christ. And when they rejected Jesus Christ as their Messiah, it started that shift from the Jew to the Gentile, and the kingdom of heaven started going into a mystery form, and it started focusing more on the Gentiles. And we saw there it was in Matthew chapter 10, where Jesus Christ, what did Jesus Christ instruct his disciples to do? When he sent them out. Yeah. Don't go to the Gentiles. He says do not go to the Gentiles. Only go to the law's house. Of, you know the, you know, the sheep of Israel. The uh, sheep of the house of Israel. Go to them only. So that's very much different than what it is for it is for us to now. Now it's neither Jew nor Gentile in the sense of the body of Christ. But when it comes to salvation it's everybody. Everybody, you give it, you know, give the gospel to every single living creature that is on on there. That's what we're supposed to do. So we seen that it was a very different type of situation. It was a transition, and what we're doing for the book of Matthew was the book of Matthew was was transitioning from Old Testament to New Testament. We've gone over it and over and over again, and we've seen where, or we've talked about how the New Testament doesn't officially start until Calvary, right? It was instituted at the Last Supper, but it wasn't in place or in place, so to speak, until Calvary. And so Jesus Christ uh, was crucified because we see that in Hebrews chapter 9, verses 15 and 17, where the testator must die first in order for a testament to begin. So as the whole time in the book of Matthew, when we're looking at that, we're looking in a sense still at Old Testament, at Old Testament times and dealing with Jesus. And we saw that last thing we saw on Thursday night on Matthew chapter 16, dealing with the rich man. And the rich man asked the Lord for how, how he was supposed to obtain eternal life. And what did Jesus Christ say? Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. No, he didn't. <laughs> no, he didn't. He never once said, believe on me. He never once said, believe in the death, burial, and resurrection of, of me. Because number one, Jesus Christ ain't been dead, hasn't been crucified yet. He hasn't been buried yet and he hasn't risen from the dead yet. What did he tell that rich man to do? Keep the commandments. Keep the law. And then he says, well, I've done all those things from youth up. I've kept the commandments. I've done all that stuff. What then? And he says, okay. I'll take your riches and sell it to the poor. And give it to the poor. Yeah. And he goes, oh, you know. <laughs> you know, Lord, I mean, come on now, you know. Uh-huh. But that was the whole, whole point. And then not, not only that, if you look down there in, in Matthew chapter 16 with that passage, it says that gee, the disciples come to the Lord and say, well, Lord, it, it, if the rich man can't get in, who can, who, who can? And there's a reason for that. There's a reason for that. reason why those, those disciples stated that, because in the Old Testament, if you were rich and you had goods and you were wealthy and you were doing good and healthy and everything else, you were right with God. In a sense, right? In the Old Testament sense, you were right with God. That's where the prosperity, all this stuff, gospel comes from, is if you're rich and rich and everything else, whatever, then you're right with God. You can be just about as dirt poor, have nothing at all, and be more rich in Jesus Christ than anything else. Today, in the church age, today. 
Paul was never that way. Paul's our apostle. He was never never rich, never in the sense of rich or whatever. He was shipwrecked, beaten, you know, and, and literally died at one point and came back and, and, and stoned and, and, and whipped and, and flogged and all that stuff and everything. Where was his prosperity? So there's differences. That's the reason, what's the whole point of what we're talking about here. There's differences in the gospel is compared to where we are now. That's what we, that we're looking at. What we looked at in the book of Matthew. We looked at some books, some aspects in the book of Mark and, and, and so forth. And, and dealing with the, the unpardonable sin. Everybody hears about the unpardonable sin all the time. The only unpardonable sin. And what is the sin that is the most unpardonable sin? Or whichever? Well, Jesus Christ mentions that in the book of Matthew. And then it clarifies it in the book of Mark. That unpardonable sin is not commit suicide, as we stated on Thursday. Not commit suicide, it's not fornication, you know, not have fornication or anything like that. It has nothing to do with any of that at all. What does it have to do with? Can anybody remember? Blaspheming the Holy Spirit is saying that Jesus Christ has an unclean spirit while he's physically here on this earth. Is Jesus Christ physically here on this earth today? No, he's not. No, he's not. So that unpardonable sin can be, in a sense, for us. It has to be when he is physically here on this earth, and that will happen again at the millennium. At the millennium, you would have, unfortunately, the folks that are here, that are, you know, whichever, they unfortunately will have that opportunity in regards to being able for the unpardonable sin because he will be physically there on this earth, and they can say, oh, he's got an unclean spirit. Well, uh, you're toast, bud. Your toes, and he ain't gonna he ain't gonna take it more lightly, like he did the first time than he is on the second time. And we'll maybe talk about that more later on. So anyway, we looked at that. We went through the book of Matthew. We, we did that. What we're just gonna do this morning is we're gonna look at the book of Acts now. We're gonna look at the book of Acts. Um, I'm trying to figure out how I want to be able to do this and everything. And the lesson I've done I've done this lesson before, and what I did before was I pretty much did like you know kind of I hit some major verses and verse and the verse in the first chapter, the first couple chapters, and and even down I think chapter ten and chapter nineteen and whichever. And 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 we did something in that regards. I may still do that, but I'm not sure. So what we're going to do though is we're going to look at the book of Acts. We're going to look at the transitioning now in the book of Acts. We're transitioning in the book of Acts. We're transitioning from Jew to the church, right? Jew to the church. The church is being introduced. The church is being brought in. And this is what we're going to start looking at. So so the book of Acts is the fifth book in order in the New Testament. And it is the 44th book of the Bible. It was written approximately around 64 to 65 AD by the beloved physician Luke. Luke also is the author of the Gospel of Luke. Now, if there was no book of Acts, then there will be no bridge from the Gospels to the rest of the New Testament. So as we've studied in this transitional book, which leads slowly and slowly from Israel to the church, it is also a history book of the early church. You want to know what the early church looks like? This is a book that you need to study. Now, although it is the fifth book in the New Testament canon, it is truly the first book of the New Testament, in a sense, right? I mean, what did we just say? The Old Testament doesn't begin, I mean, it doesn't end until Calvary, and the book of Acts initially picks right up right after Calvary, about 40 to 50 days right after Calvary, and at Pentecost, it picks up there. So, in a sense, this is technically speaking the first book, in a sense, of the New Testament. Now, as we studied in the time before, the New Testament didn't start a Calvary and so forth. We're going to keep, I ain't going to keep beating that up to death, whichever. So this is the period. Uh, let's see here. So at the death of Jesus Christ, the New Testament comes in force, and God begins an entirely new way of dealing with mankind. This is the period which exists today in God's relationship to man. Now, if we had our tripod, I would like... <laughs> I will set up our chart, you know, our little timeline chart, but unfortunately, the tripod decided to grow his legs out and walk off, you know, somewhere in this building somewhere, so we don't know where it's at. But anyway, so this book, the book of Acts, is the development of the early church, the development of Christian doctrine, the problems involved in overcoming prejudice, and the calling out of the greatest Christian who ever lived, Paul. It also gives us a pattern for real Biblical Christianity, where no one could miss it. 
It gives us, number one, street preaching. We street preach here at Truth Baptist Church. It gives answers to prayer. It gives soul winning. It gives doctrinal controversy. It gives persecution. It gives the revelation of salvation by grace of God alone. It also gives Christians organized into local churches, into local assemblies. It gives believers only partaking of water baptism. Believers can only take water baptism. It also gives expectancy of the immediate return of the Lord Jesus Christ. It gives Christian charity and unity of purpose. It gives missions and missionary activity as the essence of obedience to the Lord Jesus. And lastly, it gives Bible teaching in the local assembly. But not only that, this is the book of the greatest controversy, doctrinal controversy, that a lot of Christian groups get messed up on. This is the book. This is the book they, they like to lay their foundation on, like the Pentecostal, the charismatic movie. They like to lay their foundations here in the book of Acts. The Church of Christ. The Church of Christ is an, another big one that likes to lay their foundations here in the book of Acts, in Acts chapter 2. They like to lay their foundation there. There's a lot of your cults and a lot of your different other uh, 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 friend denominations of, of, of Christians and whichever. They lay their foundation here. Now that is very dangerous, as we're going to see. Because the book of Acts is a transitional, it's a shifting, moving book. You can't really nail it all down. Because if, you, if we're going to start looking here in, in a little while, we see that Things are different when it comes to requirements for getting the Holy Ghost. Acts chapter 2, you can be repent, be, be baptized, and, then, and you can receive the Holy Ghost. And then one time, somebody gets baptized and doesn't receive the Holy Ghost. And they got to have the disciples, the apostles, come and lay hands on them. And then you got another time where somebody gets baptized and they receive the Holy Ghost. So there's a lot of shifting that's going on here in the book of Acts that it's just very, very, can be very, in some ways, confusing if. You don't know how to learn how to rightly divide the word of truth. So this is where it happens. The book, the book for the doctrinal proof text of major false doctrines, which again is why we're dealing with these studies. The teaching of the first one is the teaching of Calvin and hyper Calvinist. They come up in this book. The teaching of the hyper dispensations, that's the big one. Because <laughs> the hyper dispensation of Brother Byron, if y'all were here to listen to that. Uh, when, when Brother Byron was pre, uh, teaching on, on hyper dispensation on that Sunday night, I mean, they go through all the book of Acts, and they just tear that thing, all the pieces, man. They say that the church starts with Paul at, at Acts 9, then they'll say the church don't start till Acts, uh, what, 18, and, and something like, well, it, it ain't all the way to the end of Acts, in Acts chapter 28, it really doesn't start. I mean, they just, they completely just mutilate the book of Acts to begin with in that regards. But that's where the teaching of the hyper dispensations come, here in the book of Acts. The next thing of the a doctor, a heretical doctrine that comes out of this book is the teaching of baptismal regeneration from the Catholics in the Church of Christ. They like to take Acts chapter 2. When they go to Acts chapter 2, they will say, in order for you to be saved, you have to be baptized. You got to get dunked, or you got, for the Catholics' sake, you got to get sprinkled. And then you can be saved. But then again, you don't know if you're really saved at all, whichever. You could lose it, but you're not real sure. And what is so funny about the, about the Church of Christ is specifically is I've had conversations plenty of times with these guys, and uh, I point down, I mean, literally pinpoint and ask them, like, you know, if an individual believed in the Lord Jesus Christ right now at this very moment, and then he walks right out in the traffic, you know, to whatever, and got hit by a car or whichever, and dies, where does that individual go? Is he saved? Does he go to heaven? Or does he go to hell? You know what the individual told me? He goes to hell because he never got baptized. I said, man, that's a shame. I said, I guess the dying thief on the cross, uh, you know, beside the Lord Jesus, when he, when he, uh, uh, when he confessed Jesus Christ or whatever, he, he, um, I guess he went to hell too, because he, they didn't take him down from the cross and dunk him in the Jordan, then bring him back up to the cross and then nail him. That, that didn't happen. Oh well, he was Jewish, so he already already had the, you know, the baptism before. Come on, man, don't give me that line. Quit pulling my leg, man. Don't, don't, don't give me that. Don't, don't give me that, that, that line right there. 
<laughs> I mean, really. But that's where they get this. But but the thing is, what's so funny though is is this is when if for them when they teach if somebody loses it, i.e. Uh, they've already they've you know repented, you know been baptized and everything else or whatever. When they got that and then they lost it, do they got to get baptized again? Some say no. What, 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 hold on, wait a second. You just told me that in order for somebody to be saved, you had to repent and be baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ in order to get saved. Now you're telling me this man loses salvation because you believe that you can lose your salvation. This man loses his salvation, but yet he doesn't have to turn around and get baptized again. Boy, I'd say that's about as nuttier than a Snickers bar, man. I, I Just nuts, man. Just nuts. Thank God we don't lose our salvation, but... But, but the point of the matter is, is you need to tell me you're going to teach that you got to get wet in order to get saved, and then if you lose it, you can, you don't have to get wet again. What? What? Oh. Anyway, and then lastly is the teaching of the healing and the tongues movement of the charismatics, like the Church of God, the Pentecostals, and so forth, like that. That's the, that's where they love to get in there because they get that over there from. Uh, um, uh, when the apostles and so forth, and the Holy Ghost fell upon the apostles, and, and you know, like you know, it was they, they saw it as a, as a flame of fire was above their heads, whichever. And of course, they like to connect that with Matthew chapter three, talking about uh, uh, talking about the you know the baptism of fire. That's baptism, but that ain't the baptism of fire. Mm -mm, nope, 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 nope. But they like to mess with that, and they're talking about the tongues and everything. I had a a lady one time, a long time ago. I'm not going to say who or where or anything like that or whatever, but she asked me, she's like, she said, um, she said, oh, do you got to get the tongues? Because I told her that I was going into the ministry and so forth or whatever. It's a long time. She said, oh, so you got to get tongues. You got to get tongues. Every time I hit my thumb with a hammer. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, um, I said, no. Oh, she said, oh you, oh, you ain't learned how to yet, have you? And I said, Again, at the time, unfortunately, I'm at a work setting, so I can't really do but so much and say but so much. I said, you know what? I got an idea. I said, how about this? I said, look, I'm going to do a little, I'm going to give you a little homework assignment, assignment for tomorrow. She was like, what? I said, just don't worry about it. So I went back to the house that night or whatever, and I just started, I mean, I just started laying everything out, you know, you know, talking about the tongues and so forth and what they for for a sign and everything. Jews require a sign and, you know, we laid the whole thing out and let, you know, showed where over there in, in the book of Acts, which we'll see, we'll see that those tongues that are spoken were not, you know, unknown, crazy, you know, blah, 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 blah you know, untie, hostile, untie, untie, bow tie type of tongues. It was actually foreign languages of these individuals and so forth. I laid it all down. I mean, it was a whole thing. I mean, a whole page full. Verses and everything. At the bottom, I just had the bottom, but you know, you know, God bless you, love you, you know, smile, you know. <laughs> Probably shouldn't have done that. But then I gave it to her. I said, Hey, I want you. I said, w Would you be willing to study this? Would you be willing to break? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I said, Hey, what you study? You know, study that, whatever. I ain't heard a peep after that. A <laughs> peep after that. But that's the thing. That's where these doctrines, that's where these crazy doctrines, in a sense, come from. Now, are they in the Bible? In a sense, I mean, I mean, uh, uh, the aspect of, of of what we just talked about in regards to to baptism. I mean, you know, one person gets dunked and gets the Holy Spirit. One person gets dunked doesn't get the Holy Spirit. One person gets dunked. I mean, that's there, isn't it? I, I mean, it is. Is tongues in the Bible? I, I mean, yeah, it is. It is there, right? I mean, it's not something that we're just completely just you know running rabbit over and saying it's not there and thing. That's what some people like to go with, but it, it is there. But you have to learn to rightly divide the word of truth and when to know to place it where it needs to be placed. Now guess what? These tongues and these signs and these healings and these miracles and stuff like that that the charismatics love to jump on and they love to go for and love to explain and go whatever, go all out on, guess what? They're coming back. But they're not coming back in the way that they would like for them to come back. They're going to come back through the Antichrist in the Great Tribulation. Remember it says over there, was it in 2 Thessalonians, it says that he comes with many signs and wonders. He's going to use those healings. He's going to use those signs. He's going to use those tongues and so forth like that to try to proclaim us that it's going to mess some Jews up. Because why? Jews require a sign. 
and it's going to jack them up so terrible. So what these charismatics, what these folks are doing today, what they're initially, what they're doing is they're just preparing the orchestra for the Antichrist when he shows up. That's all they're doing. It's, it, it, they're doing it through a demonic, devilish spirit is what's happening. I mean, I'm sorry. If you, I don't know if you ever looked at some of these services online and everything and actually watched some of the stuff, you know, some YouTube videos or some clips or whatever like that of how these guys act and react in these services. Mm-hmm. I'm going to tell you something right now. The Holy Spirit doesn't act like that. Yeah. The Holy Spirit's calm. It's meek and it's, it's soft. It's not this crazy, you know, run around, flopping on the floor like a dead fish, foaming at the mouth type of situation and that is what's happened look it up i'm not i'm not saying this just to say this or whatever i'm saying that this is i this is i have witnessed this type of situation taking place these folks over here with the snake handling if you go up in the mountains of of west virginia and the mountains of virginia and tennessee and 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 uh uh, kentucky and all that that's where you get them getting them crazy folks And Randy, my wife, she's not here this morning. She's out camping. But Randy, my wife, she would tell you, she says she remembers when she was a little girl, they had to go to a funeral one time. There was a first funeral for one of their relatives or whatever. And he was over there in, in, in the mountains of, you know, I think it was Virginia, West Virginia, wherever it was. And sure enough, she said, boy, she said, it was fine. The funeral was okay until the snakes came out. <laughs> And then the snakes came out, and they started jumping and hollering and hooting, whatever. And boy, it was woo hoo hoo. Yeah, it was. It was. It was something else. But here's the thing. And of course, for them, they say, you know, if you've been bit, if you get bit by the snake or whatever, that means you got some sin in your life. You need to repent and confess and so forth. Right? Okay. I saw this one. This this video. This one guy who literally got nailed by this. This I think it was a rattlesnake. He was handling around wherever it was and got nailed by this joke, and he died. He died right there because he refused to go to the hospital. I guess so. I guess so. That's where these teachings come from. They come from here in the book of Acts. They come from here in the book of Acts. Of course, that, they're right there in that whole snake stuff where blood that goes all the way back to Paul when, you know, he's, you know, shipwrecked and that, that serpent bites him and doesn't, nothing happens to him and just throws him off or whatever. But again, that has to deal with the simple fact of, of Jews. There was some Jews that were there. That was around him in that regards. Those things are for the Jews, and they're not for you, and they're not for me. We go by what? Faith. Not by sight. That's what we got to understand. That's what it's got to be understand. Uh, so with that, we will look more in detail with each of these kind of a groups of these peoples and so forth. When we actually, we're going to do, I am going to do a study on some aspects of cult and, and false teachings and so forth. We're going to do like I mean, a little small study. Maybe we'll do that on a, on a Thursday nights or whichever, but... We are going to look at some of the things because, unfortunately, and the reason I say that we are going to look at this stuff and look at these teachings is because we need to be prepared for when we go out into the field, we go out into there to know who these people are and be able to have an answer for these people. What does it say over there? It says, you know, that you, you need to have an answer to answer of all, all, you know, to all people and so forth. You know, if somebody asks you a question, you need to be able to have some kind of an answer to that. And that's what we're going to do. And it's part of this discipleship type of situation. Now, when we went down there in, in Florida and we, and we got all this information from Brother Tillis and everything that down there, what they do and everything, you know, they do, still do have studies and everything of discipleship stuff and everything. But majority of their discipleship stuff comes when they do that, when they do that outreach. I mean, they're encountering these people and while they're walking, they are talking with one another and saying, OK, this is how it is and this is how it is. This is what they believe and so forth and so on. But we're going to have a more of an in-depth, sit-down kind of a type of study. But, but you've got to have an answer. You've got to be able to understand who you're dealing with. That's why you've got to know the enemy. We're in a war. We're in a spiritual warfare. You need to know your enemy. And I'm not saying to try to say that they're unfortunately our enemies because I really do believe that some of these folks are really genuinely saved. Yeah. I do. But they are enemy to our gospel and the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. They're preaching and teaching another false gospel, another gospel what was being uh, taught today. So what we're going to do is we're going to go through this book, and it's already 1026, which is fine. But we're going to go through this book. We're going to tackle some of the stuff in the book of Acts. Um, we'll hit some high points possibly, but we're going to do it for the first chapter. We're actually going to look at uh, uh, the verses in the sense of the first chapter here. So if you would take a Bible turn to Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1. We're going to read... Uh, 
Let's see here. Well, how about this? Uh, let's see. We'll read the uh, first eight verses for right now. Verse number one, the Bible says, The former treatise have I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and teach until the day in which he was taken up. After that, he through the Holy Ghost had given commandments unto the apostles whom he had chosen. To whom he also he showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs, being seen of them forty days, and speaking of the, of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God, and being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which, saith he, ye have heard of me. For John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. When they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, what uh, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? And he said unto them, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power. But ye shall receive power after that. The Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem, and all Judea, and in Samaria, and unto the uttermost part of the earth. Now verses 1 and 2, you see here the former treatise, of course, is the Gospel of Luke that Paul is talking about here, the Theophilus, um, which he wrote to a believer named Theophilus, excuse me. This man was apparently an early Christian in some respects who had never personally met the Lord while he was here on this earth. But considering that he was the recipient of both the Gospel of Luke and the Acts of the Apostles, he most certainly was probably one of the most best informed. Now in verses 1 and 2, Luke is confirming his authorship in that in the book of Luke we see Jesus Christ when he was 12 in the temple. That's the only book that we see Jesus Christ prior to his uh, temptation in the wilderness and prior to his baptism. We see him actually at 12 in the temple conversing with the, you know, the, 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 the Jewish leaders at the time. And those Jewish leaders are looking at him like, man, who is this kid? That's, this is the only book, uh, uh, the book of Luke was the only one that, that showed that. And but it showed when he began to teach and also where it states that he was carried up into heaven according to Luke 24, 51. So this matches exactly in the book of Acts that Luke is the author of this particular book. Now verse 3, we have Jesus Christ showing himself alive to his disciples and it states infallible Proofs. Now, just imagine what it must have seemed like to Christ's followers that evening of the crucifixion. As they waited anxiously, then the word came down from the Mount Calvary that he's dead. Just imagine how their hearts must have sunk and broken. Remember, these disciples still didn't really understand the resurrection yet. You got to remember that, again, that has to do with the aspect of, our, of our, one of our part of our study. As even the disciples didn't even understand the resurrection. So how in the world can the Old Testament be looking forward toward the cross and the New, New Testament be looking back to the cross and so forth and so on when they had no kind of picking idea about the resurrection of Jesus Christ? Jesus Christ told Peter, he called, he, he told Peter, he told his disciples, hey, I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to die and buried in three days I'm going to rise. And what did Peter do? No, you're not. Ah, uh, over my dead body, Lord, they ain't going to take you. Oh, boy, I'll, I'll, I'll pen them in the meat sacks and, and oh, they ain't going to die. And Jesus Christ let him say, get thee behind me, Satan. See, Peter didn't understand the resurrection. He didn't understand the crucifixion. He didn't understand what was going on. The disciples, all the way up to the time of, of literally of his crucifixion, they had the foggiest idea of what Jesus Christ was talking about, what was going to happen. They had no idea at all in regards to the resurrection. So again, how to work in somebody... In the Old Testament, know about the res resurrection of Jesus Christ by looking forward and so forth. They can't. They had no understanding. As a matter of fact, the Apostle Peter even goes further on in, in his epistles, say, stating that the the Old Testament prophets they searched these things out in, in, in the way that they didn't understand what they were in a sense writing. They searched these matters out trying to figure out what was going on in dealing with uh, Jesus Christ. Now, and then right dab in the middle of the week, he gets crucified. That, that, that crucifixion week, and their dreams of the kingdom were shattered. Remember, there's, there's apostles thought the kingdom was coming in. I mean, they said, oh boy, here it comes. Here's our king. Here we go. All right. 
You know, Sunday shows up. You know, they, they he comes in on on the, on the full of an ass, and 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 everybody is saying Hosanna, King, Hosanna, Son of David, Hosanna, boy, yeah. But they brought the king in, and they thought, boy, here comes the king, boy. They're gonna take over. They're gonna knock Rome off, and we're gonna have it all. And then by Wednesday, they were yelling to crucify him. They were yelling to kill him, and they did. And they're in the apostles and disciples and think, wait a second. I thought you were coming to bring the kingdom in. And that's why they asked him again here in chapter 1. Like, hey, uh, are you going to bring the kingdom in now? They were still looking for that kingdom. They were still looking for that physical kingdom to take place. And then three days later, they receive word that he is risen. Praise the Lord for that. What joy must have filled their hearts back then. But a risen Lord is no good if he remains a hidden Lord. A risen Lord is no good if he remains a hidden Lord. So that is why he showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs. Take your Bibles and turn to 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. First Corinthians chapter 15, I can turn there. First Corinthians chapter 15, look at, uh, we'll start verse 1. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein you stand. By which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. And that he was seen, here it is, to his were stars, these infallible proofs, and that he was seen of Cephas, then of the twelve. Verse 6, after that he was seen of above five hundred brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain unto this present, but some are fallen asleep. After that he was seen of James, then all of all the apostles. And last of all, he was seen of me also as of one born out of due time. So when Jesus Christ rose from the dead, he didn't rise from the dead and just go, whoop, go straight back to heaven and then, <laughs> and then, and then you know, show himself to anybody at all and just left the empty grave. No. He showed himself to his disciples and showed himself with infallible proofs that, hey, I am risen from the dead. I mean, good grief, you know, uh, Thomas. So we all get on th doubting Thomas all the time. And Thomas like, if I don't stick my fingers in them holes and I don't put my hand on his side, I'll never believe. Jesus Christ shows up, you know, boop, shows up in the upper room, says, all right, Thomas, got any experiments to run? Anything you want to say? Anything you want to do? And he didn't even touch me. He fell down and says, my Lord and my God, and believe. He showed himself with many infallible, showed himself. And not only that, he goes over there on the beach, and while he's on the beach, he's sitting there, he's, he's what's he doing? He's, cook, he's cooking fish. He's cooking fish, cooking, cooking some breakfast for the disciples. And he's sitting there and he's eating and he goes up to the upper room. And he says, look, you know, a, a, a spirit doesn't have flesh and bone like I have. Give, give, me some, give me some meat here and I'll show it to you. And get the meat, get some, get some fish and some bread, whichever, some honey. And he ate it. A ghost don't eat. <laughs> a ghost don't eat stuff. He showed himself in many infallible proofs. So here in the first Corinthians 15, 50 are the ones who have seen him alive after his resurrection. He was seen of more than 500 plus people. Now, I don't know about you, but I know the course system says, and you know, you got to have at least two witnesses to be able to confirm a thing. Yeah. 500, 500 eyewitnesses accounts saying that Jesus Christ was alive and still is today. I'm sorry. Buddha, Muhammad, Confucius, Joseph Smith, Mary, and all the rest of the cult leaders are still dust in the grave today. Somewhere on this earth, but our Lord and Savior has risen and showed himself alive. The many infallible proofs is the perfect word in which the Holy Spirit uses. The word infallible is defined, not fallible, not capable of erring, entirely exempt from liability to mistake, 
not liable to fail or to deceive confidence, certain as infallible evidence, infallible success. Basically, in simple terms, it's error-proof. It's error-proof. It's not convincing proof is what the new Bibles like to, yeah. like to, like to state. Convincing proofs. Con, 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 convincing proofs. Uh, you can convince me of a lot of different things, but it doesn't mean it's true. Right? I mean, you, you, can, you can convince me that there's a, there's a green man that walks around at Suffolk at night and, and, and you know, <laughs> does some crazy stuff. Don't mean it's true. You can give me all the evidence that you want to convince, but it's not, it's not the way, uh, it's not true. Because if I can convince you of something, it, it could be wrong, especially if it's not from the written word of God. As I mentioned before, uh, uh, you can convince anybody from anything. Magicians are very convincing, aren't they? I mean, they are. I mean, they're, they're fun to watch, aren't they? You know, fun to watch. I was, there's a video that came up on, uh, on, on Facebook or some whatever, and it was this, uh, it was one of those talent shows, American talent. No, it wasn't American. It wasn't American, American talent. It was, it was some foreign country, but they had a, a talent like it is that we have on, here on the TV or whatever. And this guy took this lady out and laid her out and everything. And he, you know, how the, the magician do the put in the box. And he sawed this lady in half. And, you know, put it all apart. And, I mean, you really thought this lady was about dead as a doornail. I mean, she acted like she was dead as a doornail. And he took, she took, he went over to her feet and he touched her feet and her feet started doing this. I mean, that's, that's convincing. That's awesome, right? But it's a, it's a show. It's a show. Magicians are very convincing. Mag magicians can make you think that you're, <laughs> that you're seeing some, wow, and then all it is is just smoke screens. Smoke screens is what it is. Smoke screens. You watch magic shows sometimes and where the magician goes to everyday places and disguises himself as an ordinary man and does these wild and amazing tricks and convinces you that that's something else. These folks who can say they're levitating and everything else or whatever. But in reality, it's just all trickery. There's no such thing as quote-unquote real magic. It's convincing, but it's not infallible. It's not infallible. Infallible has no errors. Convincing proofs can have errors in them. So I'll just stick with the infallible. <laughs> now if we go a little further down in the text, come, to, come down back to Acts chapter 1, look at verse, verse 5. Verse 5. For John truly baptized with water, but he shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. That goes refers um, back to uh, this verse 5, refers about the Jesus Christ quoting from Matthew 3, 11, where John the Baptist quotes the verse as such, I indeed baptize you with water, Unto repentance, but he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. But in, Act, but in Acts 1 and 5, Jesus Christ drops the what? He drops the with the fire in the verse. Why? Well, as we just mentioned a little while ago, the fire is not like the charismatics take it in Acts 2 3, where it states that they appeared unto them cloven tongues as a fire. The fire in verse 11 of Matthew 3 is hell. It's hell. And when Jesus Christ comes back and he lights, he lights the whole thing up, even in the second habit. You don't want to get baptized with that fire. Uh, not like our charismatic buddies think they, they, that they do. The cloven tongues, like us, of fire in verse 3 of chapter 2 is not literal fire. It is as a fire. They get messed up badly. If you're lost... And you die, you will receive the baptism of fire. In which John the Baptist was, spe was speaking of it in the book of Matthew. That is why we should be preaching everywhere so that folks will not have to experience that baptism. That's why we go out in the street on Sunday afternoons and preach. That's why we go on Saturdays, uh, Pastor John and I go on Saturdays passing out tracks at Walmart and going out door to door and knocking on the doors and letting folks know uh, about us and about Jesus Christ and so forth. That's why we do those things because we don't want to see anybody being baptized with that fire. That's why you need to be talking to your family members who may be lost because you don't want to see your family members being baptized in fire. That is not what it needs to be. 
And when we finish the book of Acts, we will go straight into the Pauline epistles and, and study some things in there. But one of these things is the seven baptism in Scripture. And we've, I think we've talked about that one time before. But seven baptism in Scripture, and one of these baptisms is the baptism of fire or hell. So here in verse 5, we have Jesus Christ stating that he is going to baptize those believers with the Holy Ghost soon. Not fire, with the Holy Ghost. In verse 8, we have the greatest verse here that missionaries that use during missionary conferences. It is the best verse to use when dealing with, the, with soul winning. Now in the book of Acts, we see the transition of Israel to the church or Israel to the Gentiles. And this is the method in which the Lord was using. First, it was Jerusalem, where the religious Orthodox Jews were. Then it was the Jews in Judea. Then it was the half-breed Jews in Samaria. Then it was the Gentiles of the uttermost part of the earth. Notice again the pattern here. The gospel first went to the Jew, then to the Gentile. This is the verse that should be still used today in regards of going out and telling folks about the Lord Jesus Christ. Now here, um, January, uh, January, I wish it was January. Tired of heat, but uh, in July, at the end of July, the thirty first, we're going to have a a a, um, a board out, and what we're going to do is, and whenever I get my hands on one, I'm trying to get my hands on a on a Suffolk city map, I'm trying to get my hands on it. Whether I, I get it somewhere, I'll get it somewhere. If not, I, I'll Google Google map it or whatever. But what we're going to do is, we're going to put that map up, and put that map up, and we're going to put a map of. Of that and so forth, but a lot of churches I see they put a map of their hometown, Judea. They put a map of of their county, of you know uh, what would uh, uh, you know the time that they use the pattern there, and they put it out for the state, and then for the United States, and then of course they put it out for the uttermost parts of the world, a map of the whole you know the world for the missionaries and so forth, like that or whichever. But that's what we're going, we're going to have a board back there eventually. I got the is is on the way. Amazon's delivering it. <laughs> But it's on the way. We're going to have our, our, our stuff up there. And, and basically, something that we can view and that we can look and say, okay, that's our Judea. Right now, we need to focus on our Judea right now here in South Virginia. So, okay, that's where we're going to go. This is what we're going to do. This is how we're going to, we're going to mark that map and show that map where we, say, where we have gone through and we have given the gospel of Jesus Christ through this community. That's what we're going to do. That's what we should have in our mind. Our Judea, so our Judea is Suffolk. Our, uh, let's see here. I don't even know, was it? I don't even a county. Suffolk's not even a county. Suffolk's the city of Suffolk. It used to be Nansman County, right? And I was just all Suffolk now. I have to figure that one out. Hampton Rose, I get. Yeah, you do. Yeah, you got, uh, yeah. Holland, Whaleville. Burbage Grand, so yeah, we get a whole bunch of stuff. We'll figure it out. <laughs> but this is why we support missionaries, though. Why we support missionaries here. Our four missionaries, they're the ones that are going out to the uttermost parts of the earth. They're the ones that's going out there in the mission fields and doing stuff. And But our mission field is here at home. Right here. Anyway. Back on. What time is it? It is 1045. We're going to have to close up there. So what we do is we'll close there. At 1045, we'll close there. We'll start back up the next time on probably on Thursday night, maybe. I'm not sure. On Thursday night, we'll start on something. Uh, what we'll start on on finishing up uh, this part of the book of Acts and everything. And then, um, you know, we'll go from there. But anyway, all right. Any questions? Any comments? Any concerns? Anybody want me to shut up? All right, okay. All right, we'll go ahead and end with the word prayer. Father, we do thank you, Lord, for the day you gave us, Lord. We just ask, Lord, that you just uh, that you just bless us this morning, that you just fill us with the Holy Spirit this morning, Lord, that you just uh, that you just be with us and just give us something from your book today. Just give us something today, Lord, that we can uh, uh, go out and, and rejoice in your name and and um, give in the gospel of Jesus Christ out to this lost and dying world, Lord. But Lord, we just ask now, Lord, that you would watch over us for the rest of the service. I ask that you fill Pastor John with the Holy Spirit. Give him the words that you want him to say, want him to have for us, whether it be a rebuke, whether it be exhortation, or whatever it may be, Lord, whatever we need, Lord. Lord, give it to us this morning. We ask and pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. Oh.